Uh, first of all, <coughs> I'd like to give a territorial announcement, the RRF acknowledgement. The University of Lethbridge is seated and located in traditional Blackfoot Confederacy territory. We honor the Blackfoot people and their traditional ways of knowing and caring, and caring for this land, as well as all Aboriginal peoples who have helped shape and continue to strengthen our university community. Uh, well, we're, um, uh, our, our guest speaker tonight is Gary Geddes, a uh, distinguished poet. Um, uh, uh, I'll just say, first of all, the event was made possible in part by the Canada Council of Canada, provided funding by the Writers' Union of Canada, also by the anonymous benefactor who established the FEL Priestly Lecture Series at this university many years ago. Um, we have uh, one more uh, priestly lecture scheduled for this fall. Uh, Professor Andrew Light of the Department of Philosophy at George Mason University and the World Resources, Resources Institute. He's going to be speaking on Friday, October 25th, 7.30 in the Science, Science Commons Auditorium. And his topic will be Valuing Climate Loss and Damage. And that lecture is, like this one, is open to all, uh, free of charge. Um, <coughs> So I'll just say a little bit about Gary Geddes. Uh, he has long been considered one of Canada's most important men of letters. He has written and edited 50 books of poetry, fiction, drama, and non-fiction criticism, translation and anthologies, and won a dozen national and international literary awards, including the Commonwealth Poetry Prize, the British Columbia Lieutenant Governor's Award for Literary Excellence, and the Gabriella Mistral Prize. He has been writer in residence at the University of Alberta, UBC's Green College, Ottawa University, and Vancouver Public Library. And he lives on Phoenix Island, BC, with his wife, the novelist, Anne Harrison. And he's going to talk today about flying under the radar, politics, poetry, and peace. And I won't even attempt to guess what that means, because he's going to explain it to us. So without further ado, my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation here. I want to acknowledge my presence on Treaty 3 territory as well and thank our Indigenous hosts. I'd also, also like to thank Elizabeth Galway for setting this talk in motion, although she had to trip out for a Credence Clearwater concert tonight. I suggested we should all move over there, but it, I wasn't picked up on that. And to, to Kent Peacock for picking up the torch and Jacqueline Prada for collecting the pieces of me from the tarmac at the airport. <clears throat> and once again, the Writers' Union of Canada for helping support this event. I did not know F.E.L. Priestley personally, but was well aware of his reputation and his, and his nickname around the university was Felp. Uh, I was a graduate student at U of T at the time and as I'm hoping to share with you some thoughts about the uses and maybe also the abuses of poetry, I'd like to start by telling you about two aspects of graduate, my graduate years that, that shaped me as a writer and as a teacher. The first had to do with my MA and PhD work on Joseph Conrad, a novelist who was sometimes called England's Polish genius he authored The Heart of Darkness, Nostromo, The Secret Agent, and many other compelling works that left me humbled and spellbound as a student by both his narrative skills and his stunning use of the language. But I was particularly struck by the description of novel writing that he used. He said, writing for me is rescue work, rescuing the vanishing fragments of memory and giving them the permanence of art. It was something I would never forget and it became one of the foundation stones of my, my own literary career. The second U of T gift was of a more intimate and personal nature. I shared an office with a man named Gus Heidemann, a former Jesuit who, like me, had given up religion for literature. He would come into the office each morning and glance at his desk to see if there was another one of my sadly romantic and self-indulgent poems waiting for his assessment and response. But the day I recall most vividly, he did not glance furtively at his desk when he entered. Instead, he took a rather long time hanging up his coat as if something were on his mind. Then he turned to me and said, Gary, 
William Blake may have found a universe in a grain of sand, but you're not going to find one contemplating your belly button. So you need to stop. There are things going on out in the world, wars, migrations, poverty, hungry, hunger, violence, injustice. Perhaps you should start thinking and writing about those things. I left the office shortly thereafter and went back to the flat to nurse my wounds. I opened a beer and turned on the television where there was a news report in progress about the killings at the University of Texas in Houston. An assassin named Charles Whitman, armed to the teeth, had opened fire on the students from the university tower. I was not only overwhelmed by what I was hearing and seeing, but I also felt something physical pass through my body like an electric jolt. Here was a man who had given such considerable care and attention to assembling instruments of destruction, who also shared the surname of the famous 19th century American poet and peacenik, Walt Whitman. How was it that the Whitman clan was able to produce a poetic genius and a mass murderer? Then a line from T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock popped into my head. Indeed, there will be time, time to murder and create. What would cause the channel of energy that we all have within us to take a positive or a negative outlet? Still stinging from Gus Heidemann's brutally honest advice, it occurred to me that this was the kind of material he might have had in mind for me. Within a few minutes, I was at my computer composing, or my typewriter in those days, <laughs> composing a first-person narrative from the point of view of Charles Whitman, getting inside his head to try to sort out and make sense of the questions and moral conundrums whirling about in my own. I'd like to share the poem with you, not because it's particularly good, but because it was a milestone in my development as a poet and the first thing I'd ever written that had a faint whiff of permanence about it. It's called Tower. I loved them in my own way, enough to pay hard cash for the rifle, to plan my strategy long into the night. I did not complain about the cold wind or the exhausting climb to the tower. Even the long wait and the rank-smelling pigeons never taxed my patience. When they emerged after a time into the bright winter sun at midday, I spared no effort to steady the rifle to bring the delicate cross of the gun sights into line with their temples or breasts. And when they began to run, after the first had settled to rest in the soft snow, I never lost my cool, but took them one by one, like a cat collecting kittens. Writing for me is often about damage control, and those two U of T experiences set me on a course as an engaged writer, much of whose work concerns social and political issues. And when I'm using the word political tonight, I'm not thinking of it in terms of partisan politics, but the deeper level about who has the power and who hasn't got the power. Why this is the case, I don't know, although a psychologist might provide a few possibilities. William Wordsworth liked to describe poetry as emotion recollected in tranquility, but that's not my experience of the writing process at all. Tranquility or a kind of peace may be the end result, but it's certainly not an active ingredient for me in the writing of a poem. My experience is more like that of Rainer Maria Rilke who described poetry as the past breaking out in your heart like a tsunami or an insurrection. If poetry and politics seem like strange bedfellows to you, you're in good company. Many critics and some of my former colleagues like to point out the line in W.H. Auden's Elegy on the death of William Butler Yeats, in which the speaker says, poetry makes nothing happen as if this were gospel. Yet Yeats himself could be quite political in a nonpartisan way in poems like The Second Coming. And Auden in his essays is famous for having said, 
the mere making of a work of art is a political act, as it reminds the management that we are humans and not automatons. Terror, war, displacement have been central to poetry from the beginning. You don't have to look further than, than the epics of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, or Virgil's Aeneid. <clears throat> According to Homer and Virgil, the gods are afflicted with problems similar to ours. Ego, lust, gold, greed, ambition, all of which can lead to trouble, even to war. Take the story of the Trojan horse. Towards the end of an unsuccessful 10-year siege to recapture the incomparable Helen of Troy, whose beauty launched a thousand ships, the Greeks build an enormous wooden horse and leave it outside the gates of Troy. <clears throat> the Trojans, believing the war over and the horse a departing gift from the enemy, bring the huge wheeled toy into the city and drunkenly celebrate the end of the siege. During the night, a trap door in the belly of the horse opens and an elite guard led by Odysseus drops to the ground, opens the gates to their army and proceeds to sack the city. The Trojan horse is on one level a love story, but it's also about this, a story about betrayal, revenge and slaughter. It tells us a lot not only about human nature, but also about tribal relations. Or to put it another way, the Trojan horse is not so much a story about security, that is, what not to let into your country or into your mind, as it is a powerful lesson about the failure of diplomacy and foreign policy, a story that warned us long ago about the kind of conditions that could lead to the attacks of 9-11 or the election of a dangerous fool like Donald Trump. Why did Homer write about these matters in his poetry? He wrote about them because people had lost sight of civic virtues, because violence and war threatened to engulf the nation, threatened to destroy the fragile social fabric. He wrote about them because he believed the lessons contained therein would help the Greeks and the rest of us understand our destructive impulses and cultivate more sensitive forms of government and a more enduring social contract. He also knew people absorb values not directly through sermons or edicts, but indirectly through narrative or story, through media that entertains and parables that teach through delight. Now it's interesting to talk about poetry and politics for me because I went to Chile some years ago during the final years of the, of the dictatorship, Pinochet dictatorship, and I interviewed a man named Jaime Hallas, who was the editor of Analysis magazine. Jaime Hallas uh, was sitting in front of a photograph, a large photograph of his foreign affairs editor who had been murdered by Pinochet's thugs. And I said, what's it like in terms of censorship in this country? He said, things here are quite unusual. Here your book may survive, but you may not. So when I got home, I, I started to do, to do a lot of thinking about the role of poetry and uh, all sorts of things came to mind. The American poet uh, who said, publishing a book of poems is like dropping a rose petal into Grand Canyon and waiting to hear the echo. In Canada, Margaret Lawrence, uh, or, or Margaret Atwood once said, you can say anything you want in Canada in a poem because nobody's listening. <laughs> Robertson Davies said, being a writer in Canada is as inno innocuous as being a manufacturer of yogurt. A.Y. <laughs> Jackson, and this is the, 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 the these, these comments go on. A.Y. Jackson said, Canadians would rather support a boa constrictor than a poet. Well, Anyway, this, this has been true at various points, but I probably wouldn't be here tonight if it were still, still true. Poetry and politics have been intimately connected from the start. In fact, poetry itself is a bit of a Trojan horse, a subversive force. It gets under the skin, into the bones. Like the stealth bomber, it moves at great speed below the radar, 
outside the usual paths of rational thought. How does it do this? Well, it was explained to me years ago by an Australian poet psychologist. He said, poetry is a primary process language with the power to touch us at the deepest level because it's the, it's the language which we learned at our mother's breast, a language that eschews logic and reason, a language that privileges sound over sense. A toddler loves rhythm, sucks syllables, consonants, around, uh, rolls them around in her mouth, and she embraces nonsense syllables. She has no trouble imagining a cow jumping over the moon or a dish running away for a clandestine weekend in Calgary with a spoon. The child finds magic in all sounds emanating from herself and the people around her, repeating these sounds endlessly. In this way, she constructs a substitute umbilical cord. The poetic language not only forges a new link to the mother, but also enables her to connect with other humans. This sound or music-based language of our beginnings never leaves us. It persists as a sort of organ bass deep in the psyche. In moments of extreme joy or loss, we return to, that, we return to poetry, that rich primal language of the heart. For those who think that the phrase political poetry is a contra contradiction in terms, I like to quote James Scully's comment from his book called Line Break, Poetry as Social Practice. He says, political poetry is not a contradiction in terms, it's an instructive redundancy. Poetry shares with other branches of rhetoric the intention to, to persuade, not so much through argument as through the use of narrative, music, image, evocative language. And the American poet laureate Robert Haas put the matter quite simply when he said, because rhythm has direct access to the unconscious, because it can hypnotize us, enter our bodies and make us move, it is a power and power is political. So what has all this got to do with peace? Because it's a primary process language, poetry speaks to the wound in each of us to the part of us that is damaged, incomplete, that part that's so often in ruins. Poetry is one of the healing arts. Dylan Thomas thought his task as a poet was to get things straight, to understand the troubling world he found himself in and to give it imaginative shape. He was an alcoholic. He had difficulty controlling his impulses, even the impulse to write. He found poetry just as challenging as living. According to his letters and essays, he considered himself day by day be, to be in the middle of an emotional maelstrom, a battlefield where there was no easy solution, no quick fix. Listen to what he has to say about the challenge of writing and by extension, living. Out of the inevitable conflict of images, inevitable because of the creative, destructive, contradictory nature of the motivating center, the womb of war, I try to make that momentary peace, which is the poem. I notice mainly uh, the, the word momentary. The peace poetry affords is not permanent. It's no more enduring than the peace afforded to Israelis and Palestinians by the Oslo Accords. It needs to be renegotiated daily. In other words, poetry, like peace itself, is a process, a way of life, a daily discipline of self-assessment and commitment and renewal, driven, we hope, by good faith. This is not an easy task because language like politics is an unstable medium. It's dirty with sound, with secondary meaning, with unexpected connotations that come zinging in from the side to torpedo the best of intentions. Poets must work with this unstable medium, bring it under control, make it sing again. When it's genuinely singing, poetry has the power to touch what is broken in us, to mend what is damaged. These wounds unite us as human beings, and as poets, feminists, and psychologists tell us, 
we need to get in touch with that breakage, that damage, because the place of damage is also the place of power. I'm sometimes asked by students and readers what determines the subjects I write about. I don't go looking for subjects, but they definitely come looking for me. And there's a, a lovely phrase that seems to embody what I've learned about my relationship to material. It was shared with me by a graduate student uh, when I was teaching at Bellingham in Western Washington University. It's the phrase, the ventriloquism of his history. It's as if there are figures in the recent or distant past lurking about, looking for vulnerable suckers like me to tell their story. Sooner or later, one of them takes me by the throat and demands to have his or her story told. This happened to me with the Chinese terracotta warriors when I visited that country. It happened to me with Paul jo jo Joseph Chartier, the so-called mad bomber of the House of Commons who blew himself up in the men's washroom. It happened again with the iron workers lost or injured during the collapse of the second Narrows Bridge in Vancouver and so on. The irony here is that I'm never quite sure whether I'm the ventriloquist or the dummy. Ask my wife. <laughs> I've always thought of my poems and some of my nonfiction prose as urgent final messages. And now as an old coot, this co uh, conviction is even stronger. <clears throat> so I'm going to <clears throat> share with you some of the poems that I felt compelled to write about, deeply troubling, it, deeply troubling moments. The first of these concerns the killings at Kent State University on the 4th of May, 1970. Students at Kent State and around the world were pro protesting the escalation of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Instead of just burning draft cards and braziers to get the attention of the authorities, the students at this quiet Midwest college torched a small military Quonset hut. They got more at attention than they'd bargained for. The next morning, the Ohio National Guard opened fire on the unarmed de demonstrators killing four and wounding nine others. I was caught up at the time as a graduate student with the anti-war protests outside the US consulate on University Avenue in Toronto and was staggered by the tr this turn of events. It seemed as if a generation gap the size of the Grand Canyon had opened up between me and the generation of my parents. I tried to write about it but I wasn't willing to settle for cheap shots or angry diatribes against American foreign policy. There were enough bad, crappy poems written on that subject already. I struggled with this subject for six years without success. Then, while I was writer in residence at the University of Alberta, I chanced on a small red paperback at the Wee Book Inn, a secondhand shop on White Avenue. This book was called The Killings at Kent State and it was written by that remarkable American investigative journalist, I.F. Stone, who was trying to understand why no one in the military was ever brought to trial for those killings. I paid my dollar, read the book, walked home in sub-zero weather. What struck me at once were four details about one of the victims, a young woman named Sandra Lee Scheuer. She was a speech therapy student, very tidy, not especially political, and she liked to roller skate. As soon as I had, had that concrete material in hand, I chucked my six years of notes and uh, began to write this poem, which took me only a few hours. It turned out to be not a diatribe against US foreign policy, but a simple elegy mourning the terrible waste of life a young woman caught in the cross currents and the cross hairs of history. In the words of composer Tchaikovsky, this was going to be my effort to find beauty amid the wreckage of the soul. And it's called Sandra Lee Scheuer. You might have met her on a Saturday night, cutting precise circles clockwise at the Moonglow roller rink 
or walking with quick step between the campus and a green two-story house, where the room was always tidy, the bed made, the books in confraternity on the shelves. She did not throw stones, major in philosophy, or set fire to buildings, though acquaintances say she hated war, had heard of Cambodia. In truth, she wore a modicum of makeup, a brazier, and could no doubt more easily have married a guardsman than cursed or put a flower in his rifle barrel. While the armories burned, she studied, bent low over notes, speech therapy books, pages open at sections on impairment, physiology, and while they milled and shouted on the commons, she helped a boy named Billy with his lisp, saying, hiss, Billy, like a snake. That's it, Shh. tongue well up and back behind your teeth. Now buzz, Billy, like a bee. Feel the air vibrating in my windpipe as I breathe. As she walked in sunlight through the parking lot at noon, feeling the world a passing lovely place, a young guardsman who had his sights on her was going down on one knee as if he might propose. His declaration, unmistakable, articulate, flowered within her, passed through her neck, severed her trachea, taking her breath away. Now who will burn the midnight oil for Billy, ensure the perilous freedom of his speech? And who will see her skating at the moon glow roller rink, the eight small wooden wheels making their countless revolutions on the floor. I learned quite a bit from the writing of that poem, including the fact that anger, for me, produces only diatribes, whereas inti intimate details are powerful, more powerful than generalities and large-scale subjects. The second poem emerged from a trip to the Middle East following the Oslo Accords. I traveled to Israel and Palestine with my friend John Asfour, a Lebanese-Canadian poet who'd lost his eyesight outside the village of Aitanit as a young boy when he picked up a discarded grenade that exploded in his face. We did poetry readings in West Bank, Gaza, Israel, the cities of Birzeit, Nablus, Ramallah, Jerusalem, Haifa, Bar Ilan, and interviewed ordinary Palestinians, activists, and politicians like Said, Said Arakat, as well as Israeli settlers, activists, refuseniks, soldiers who refused to take up arms against Palestinians. Although there was modest hope for a two-state solution amongst Palestinians and progressive Israelis, we were shocked to discover that the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, was still bulldozing houses that belonged to any Palestinians who had a family member determined to challenge the apartheid conditions to which he or she were being subject subjected. And this is one of the poems that emerged from that experience. It's called, What Does a House Want? A house has no unreasonable expectations of travel, or imperial ambitions. A house wants to stay where it is. A house does not demonstrate against partition or harbor grievances. A house is a safe haven, anchorage, place of rest. Shut the door on excuses, greed, political expediency. A house remembers its original inhabitants, ventures comparisons. The woman tossing her hair on a doorstep the man bent over his tools and patch of garden. What does a house want? Laughter, sounds of lovemaking to strengthen the walls. A house wants people, a permit to persevere. A house has no stones to spare. No house has ever been convicted of a felony unless privacy be considered a crime in the new dispensation. What does a house want? Firm joints, things on the level water rising in pipes. Put out the eyes, forbid the drama of exits, entrances. Somewhere in the rubble, a mechanism leaks time. 
no place familiar for a fly to land on. This next piece, and I'm just going to, if I have time, I'm going to read two more pieces uh, for you. What time do we have? Half an hour? Okay. Anyway, this is about the cl uh, uh, climate crisis. crisis. I'm, I'm married to a, a, a biologist and a novelist, Anne Erickson, and she is very much involved in environmental and uh, climate crisis issues at the moment. So I'm, I'm reading all of the stuff that she's reading for her research. And sometimes I don't know where to put my face after I read it, and I don't know how to get to sleep at night. <clears throat> On the West Coast, a lot of things are happening. We're, we're told that worldwide we're losing 200 species to, per day. We noticed on the coast where I live a radical reduction in the number of shorebirds and the disappearance of sea stars that have perished from a wasting degree disease that turns them overnight into a blob of jelly, no doubt attributable to ocean warming. The most disturbing loss is among the iconic orcas or killer whales whose numbers are decreasing annually. Statistics don't produce poems, but specific details sometimes do. So recently we were exposed to disturbing video images of a female killer whale identified as J35, pushing the dead body of her newborn calf to keep it above water for 17 days. Imagine. The southern killer whales in British Columbia, otherwise known as orcas, are starving because we've overfished the spring salmon that are their principal diet. They're nearing extinction because we've polluted the coastal waters, because our excessive industrial and logging activities have destroyed salmon spawning habitats. And by introducing farmed Atlantic salmon infected with lice and neurological diseases along the migration routes of wild salmon fry, we've all but eliminated the orca's main food source and other species as well. Now, sir, uh, super tankers taking dirty oil to Asia seem destined to complete the task. So, try as I might, I tried to put together a poem about J35. And I tried to imagine myself as a young man with my children, uh, uh, very, very young, and trying to tell them about what was happening to the orcas. And here's how it goes. Do animals cry, she asks. I don't know, I say, but I think they grieve. I'd read about a camel that sniffed her dead offspring for days and wouldn't move until they placed its pelt on her back. Why do you ask? Her hand across the breakfast counter looks tiny beside mine. A milk ring graces her mouth. A toasted breadcrumb clings to her cheek. All I can think to offer is a sympathetic smile. J, sir, 35, she says, scarcely audible. The orca in the news has carried her dead calf for 14 days, trying to keep it above water, traveling hundreds of miles as J-pod forages for the scarce Chinook salmon. When it isn't resting on her head, she grips its tail with her teeth. J-35 knows her baby's dead, she whispers. I think she's trying to tell us something. I leave the science out for now. The most polluted mammal on Earth, the slew of toxins female orcas slough off on their newborns, extinction looming, salmon stocks depleted, tanker traffic, the old railroad the Vikings celebrated, now a web of dirty shipping lanes, booming grounds, plastic archipelagos. I think you're right, I say. Let's see what we can do. The last piece is uh, one that I'm very reluctant to read you, but I feel compelled to do so. I spent the last five and a half years working with indigenous elders uh, who were telling me about their experiences in the segregated Indian hospitals. And, and in the healthcare system generally. 
these were uh, terribly difficult stories for them to tell and really difficult for me to know how to write about it. But I eventually, thanks to the, their grace and resiliency, produced a book called Medicine Unbundled, a journey through the minefields of indigenous healthcare. And this is a book, in case you're interested. So all of that book is about what happened to people and how they were given substandard uh, medicine and it, it's still happening. At the end of that book, somebody said to me, why are you still talking about this? These hospitals closed years ago, most of them anyway. And I said, if, if the racism that caused all this damage to indigenous people is over, how was it possible for Brian Sinclair to walk in or wheel himself into an emergency in Winnipeg and die in his wheelchair unattended, th waiting 34 hours with an infection that could have been treated with antibiotics. So the stuff is still going on. Well, in the midst of this, I, my house on Thetis Island is about 500 yards from the site of the infamous Cooper Island Residential School. There were well, there sexual abuse, murder, and all sorts of uh, terrible things happened in that, that school, some of which I talk about in the book. But I couldn't, I, I couldn't help something building up in me. All, all, the, all that I was learning from people about their residential school experiences just started to, to take a shape inside me. And it was one of those moments of vent the ventriloquism of history again. A voice began to form. And I'm just going to read you a little bit about this from this voice, from a poem called The Resumption of Play. When the uh, children in Cooper Island Residential School went out to play at lunchtime, they couldn't relax until the window opened on the fourth floor and the brother or priest leaned out and called a number. And if that was your number, you were the plaything for the afternoon and then people could relax and play. That's where the title comes from. It's called The Resumption of Play. I hope that this is not perceived as, a, as a, an appropriation of voice but rather as a gift of voice I was digging clams and oysters at low tide when they came gathering, uniforms spotless. I didn't hear the vehicle arrive, but the crunch of boots on shells could be distinguished over the sea wash and clunk of clams hitting the metal pail. They dragged me kicking one on each arm, the galvanized vessel left at water's edge. Grandfather had explained in detail how clams propel themselves deeper in sand when threatened. And so I offered thanks and stood afoot from the hole I'd started to dig. Against my protests and without warning or ceremony, father absent on the hunt, the two elders stricken, mother wailing and beside herself, they dropped me like an extricated clam into the metal bed of the pickup. No time to decompress or see the sights, straight to the harbor where a small boat waited, engine running. I bit the hand that tried to lift me from the box. Jesus H. Christ, teach this little piece of shit a lesson for me. Dragged down the ramp by my hair kicking. I like his spirit, said the man at the helm, exhaling. We'll scrub the dirt off first, make sure the little bugger's not white underneath. I knew a couple of English curses, but the crewman spoke my language, the last time I'd hear it uttered freely, without fear of consequence. He untied the lines and let the bow swing out. Don't mind those guys, he whispered with a wink. They're under government orders. A light chop struck the bow. Relax, kid. This trip's a breeze compared to what awaits you over there. It's not what I intended, this litany of abuse. Realization came during a composition class. I'd spent the hour teaching kids the correct use of pronouns. Don't say her and me are going, but she and I. 
When I told them that her and me are used as objects of verbs and prepositions, as in, they killed her, or sock it to me, all eyes glazed over and one of them whispered a word I'd never heard before, Corinthianscheisen. Explain for the edification of the class, I demanded. Please, sir, Gertrude, blonde hair, Marlene Dietrich pose. It's German, sir. I'll write it down and leave it on your desk. Buzzer, ebbing tide of laughter, tightly folded scrap of paper. The translation, too tight assed to shit a current. Bingo. It wasn't always so. My sphincter stretched and penetrated. Schoolyard fun and games suspended while the Holy Father, waiting for the Holy Father to shout a number from his open window. God has much for you to learn, he said, applying the Vaseline. No mention what the lesson was, though I surmised it had to do with power, authority. As he drove his point home, I could hear the resumption of play, a low rumor rising slowly like an organ bass outside the outside. He insisted I recite the Lord's Prayer as he went about his business. My turns were infrequent as he had other favorites. Time for the shame to burn off and bury myself in the books of Greek mythology he loaned me from his shelf. And so my education was advanced. A clam, the textbook explains, has a mouth, kidney, anus, but no heart. No wonder I felt such affinity for this bivalve mollusk that uses abductor muscles to yank its half shells tight at the slightest threat. Like them, I clam up in social situations, keep my mouth shut even as the puns accumulate, emotions run rampant. I prefer the privacy of high tide, avoid the phallic gooey duck so rich in amino acids and testosterone producing zinc. The horny marinos, marine biologist next door s scares the living daylights out of me. A sick heart's the obvious exception as it can endure a decade or more in lockup, another running full speed, and still supply vital organs, blood. What to do with the anger and the shame? I was blinder than Homer with stories no one wanted to hear, a ragged script wrestling its way to clarity. Blindness has its virtues, I suppose. It forces you to listen, to feel the air electric, the body's light that makes the hair rise and move like eelgrass in a tidal pool. Eyes widened at the pub to hear me speak of moral turpitude, sexual abuse, murder in God's name, and the church's failed instruments of the divine. Enough sermons, my buddies jeered. More beer, less bullshit. I drunkenly complied, sounded advice from hell's beleaguered saints, disciples all, whose uncloistered virtues surpassed so liberally scattered their teachers' morbid litanies. Sadder, Budweiser. Chances of survival were 50-50 in the residential school. Unmarked graves, graves contained the bones of infants aborted by the nuns, children dead from beatings or disease, immune systems compromised by hunger, loneliness. A decade spent viewing the world through a haze of drugs and alcohol. My children neglected, my wife driven to distraction. When AA meetings failed, I yielded to the sweat lodge, feeling the anger seep out through my pores, the stone begin to lift from my chest. Good news for Sisyphus. A year to dry out with help of friends, song, drumming, dance, all of us scarred, bearing the marks of war. Nursed, embraced, encouraged to go back, take the children with me. I didn't know if I could do it or if I wanted to. I returned home a stranger. The paved road held no magic. The trees no longer spoke to me. Father lost at sea, mother overcome by grief and joy, did not know how to say it in my new language. 
Grandfather smiled and placed a metal bucket by my chair. When I did not respond, he picked it up and dragged his crippled body to the shore to dig for clams. The tide was out. The sea, a looking glass, reflected our mutual despair. I walked to water's edge, touched his shoulder, and gently eased the shovel from his hand. As I applied my weight to the blade and felt it cut deep, the tidal funk awoke some feelings long submerged, and I found myself weeping and laughing at the same time. A creature, naked, shucked, fit for neither sea nor land. Thank you. I'd be very happy to answer any questions, or address any comments you'd like to make. In these, these shared residential, I mean, these residential school stories, they're, they're shared part of the Canadian experience. When there's something as Canadian as on all sides, and then we have to, we have to process and come to terms with. And, I mean, your poem very evocatively begins that process. Um, but I also wonder, I mean, I, I was struck by your tower poem earlier on, where in a sense you're wondering, yeah, so what's it like to be up there on the tower doing the, doing the nasty stuff? Um, so I'm wondering about that as a, another use of poetry from, from those of us who are on, not necessarily on the other side of the story, somebody who thought it was a good thing to participate in it, but wondering, so what the hell went out on the other side? How are these people processing it from work part? And, and if there's room there through poetry to explore that side as well. Maybe people are, maybe you are. But I wonder about that side of processing these stories as well. And then for those of us from the outside, trying to make sense of it from all sides. It was a real challenge for me to, to do the book called Medicine Unbundled. I thought, I, as an academic, I thought I could use my skills as a researcher and do this in short order. I sent out 100 emails to band councils, and I didn't get a single response. I then uh, made phone calls and had some lovely conversations, but nothing happened. So I said to my friend, the Songhees elder, Joan Morris, who had asked me to write this book and who was, had been trying for 15 years to, to talk about segregated hospitals. I said, Joan, what am I doing wrong? She said, where do you want me to start? I knew nothing about protocol and I had to learn, you know, the other thing she said was that the trouble with, I, I have with white people is that they don't know how to listen. So that became a mantra that I heard quite a lot and had to uh, understand. And what I learned fairly quickly is that word of mouth contacts are the only way to establish the kind of trust that makes the sharing of stories possible. So when Joan trusted me and introduced me to a friend, and they did the same too, gradually this small network expanded all the way to Montreal. And uh, I, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but it was the grace and resilience, the grace under fire and resilience of the indigenous elders that I talked to, and their sense of humor, most of which was at my expense, uh, which kept them going and, and it gave me a, a sense that I was making some progress. I, in fact, I was making friends rather than talking to people as sources of information. I developed friendships that are ongoing. And I said to them, everything that I write I will give to you and you will vet it. And if you don't, if it's inaccurate, if you don't like it, just I'll, I'll remove it, I'll change it. And one person couldn't bear to have her story. When she saw it written out, she couldn't bear to have the story. It was one of the best chapters of the book. I said, I'll take it out of the book. Uh, so it, it was a, it was a, a process of, of learning for me. I had to consider the ethical impact of what I was doing. I had to do the university ethics uh, program or forms as well. So you're, you're right, there are just so many different perspectives. And uh, 
I, I could talk about how this impact, this question impacted me in, Ottawa, er, in, in Africa too when I was doing a book called Drink the Bitter Root, but I don't think I, I should take that time. 